Hi, and welcome to TYT Interviews. And boy, do we have an incredible guest for you today. This is Dr. Marcus Erickson. He is a former US Marine, as well as being the research director and co-founder of Five Dyes Institute and the co-founder of Leaf Lab. So welcome to the show, Marcus. Thank you. Now, you're uh, an advocate for getting away from plastics, anti-capitalism, but you didn't start out your life as a long-haired hippie. No, not at all. Uh, you know, just the opposite. You know, I grew up in southern Louisiana where I was steeped in military culture, conservatism all around me, and what I saw, you know, growing up was wild nature. I had that privilege of being in that space. So I fell in love with wild nature. So as I grew up, began to realize, you know, I grew up next to the Mississippi River and all the trash coming down and the chemistry. I mean, they call the, the, the length of river from Baton Rouge to Louisiana uh, to New Orleans Cancer Alley for a reason. All the refineries that make petroleum also make chemistry and a lot of plastic. And that's been my focus. You know, I went from being a Marine in the first Gulf War where we're fighting for petroleum, and I don't think anyone doubts that today, to realizing, okay, there's one small slice of the pie of petroleum that makes plastics. And that's where I can make a difference. Now, you were telling me earlier about your, you, you made yourself a promise. You're at, at fighting in the Gulf War, you're a US Marine, you're in a foxhole, and you made a promise. What was that? So, yeah, that was, if you, if you recall the Gulf War, there are images of burning oil wells and giant clouds of soot. And I remember sitting there in a foxhole, covered with oil, uh, little bits and drops of soot and, and petroleum, and, you know, talking to a Marine next to me, and despite this Armageddon around us, saying to him, we're almost laughing, saying, if we survive this, let's build a raft like Tom and Huck and go down the Mississippi. And you know, 13 years later, when the most recent Iraq war started in 2003, I remember just all those memories came back to me. And it was a flood of memories and experiences and, and all the emotions around it. And I just finished my, my PhD, uh, finished grad school. And the war had just started and I had to get away. So I, I couldn't find that other Marine. I searched everywhere in the United States for, for, for his name, couldn't find him. The guy that was him. in the foxhole yes, with Yes, exactly. Yeah. Couldn't find that other Marine who I had the conversation with. So I built my raft. I took 232 two-liter plastic bottles, made, made a pontoon boat, I welded a bicycle, made a paddle wheel, had a sail and some oars, and I launched in Lake Itasca, Minnesota, at the headwaters of Mississippi, and I came down the entire river to Venice, Louisiana. That was your way of getting away from this new war that we'd started. And it was good for a couple reasons. I reconnected with the basic goodness of people. I had people help me all the time, you know, give me clothing, give me food, give me shelter as I came down the river and repairs. Had a repair shop help me weld an oar ring back on. But then what I also saw uh, was an endless trail of trash. I mean, I, I fell in love with the river and the basic goodness of people. I even go to the river today and I'll touch the river and just to reconnect. Then see this assault of plastic trash coming down the river all the time. I could always look left to right and see a plastic bottle or a bag. There's a bottle cap and there's a cup lid and there's a straw. Non-stop pouring out of the, the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico and going beyond. And it's not just this river. It's every river worldwide. It's a global issue. And I saw an opportunity to contribute something meaningful to the science of understanding how plastics hurts other life. Well, for a lot of people at home watching this, they're, they're concerned about issues like climate change. But is plastic pollution really a big deal? I mean, it's unsightly. It's probably not nice to look at. But is it really hurting anyone other than just going out there and sitting in the ocean? Well, you know, I think you just mentioned climate change. The connection there is that both climate change and plastics, they're both you know, using fossil fuels, either for energy, which have climate change implications, or for chemistry, which produce all kinds of petrochemicals, including plastics. And in both cases, there isn't much thought by the industries that make those, uh, those materials, energy and chemistry, for the full life cycle of how they're used. And you know, I'll narrow to focus to plastics, to where I focus on plastics. They're made without much thought to the entire life cycle, what, it, what the impact is chemically on you and I, but also on other life. And that's been my observation, having now led 20 exp expeditions around the world studying the distribution of plastics and finding lots of other living things impacted by it. What sort of living things are there? They're in the ocean, but obviously like no fish is gonna eat a floating tire or anything like that. So are they really, how much are they impacting on the marine life when these plastics drift out into the ocean? 
Well, you know, when I began doing this work, um, I'd say maybe 15 years ago, there was one research paper identified 267 species that we had research showing they were impacted by trash. Today, there was one, one recent meta-analysis, over 1,200, and it's ingestion, it's entanglement. And by entanglement, I mean like, like whales and turtles and seabirds and marine mammals um, all getting caught up in trash, in old fishing nets, and in tires, and, and you, can, you see sea turtles eating plastic bags and straws coming out of their noses, all kinds of these horrific scenes of entanglement. But the ingestion is pretty widespread. We're finding micro and nanoplastics in hundreds of species, including many uh, that are harvested from the sea to feed humanity. Lots of fish, lots of shellfish. So the fish and the shellfish are eating the plastic, and then we're eating the fish and the shellfish. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and I can show you what that stuff looks like. What the yeah, breakdown. Yeah, let's, let's have a look. So this is this is a pretty typical sample of of how plastic is found in the marine environment. There's this mythical. Where's this from? Idea of of this North Pacific, mm -hmm. of an island of trash in the North Pacific. If you've the heard Great of, Pacific Garbage Patch, and that's a myth, and and that's that's a huge myth of this Great Pacific Garbage Patch. This this island of trash, it does not exist. It looks like this. So this is after dragging in a net over an area maybe as big as one entire football field. You drag your net for miles and miles. You put all the stuff into a bowl and you swirl it around, which you're left with are these, this handful of this multicolored confetti. They look like particles. microbeads. Are they all microbeads? They're all microplastics. Microbeads are kind of primary uh, plastic. They're produced to be small objects, but these are the broken down secondary microplastics from broken, broken down buckets and crates and, and forks and knives and, and bags and Stores couplets. And, and, yeah. You can name a thousand things <laughs> made of plastics that refined, you know, on our streets and leading out to sea. And they break down and become these little particles. Yes. So you can see here, these are the broken down uh, objects, buckets and crates and, and, and bags and straws and bottles and bottle caps and stir sticks and all the things, throwaway plastics we see. So they don't, this. they break up, but they don't break down. Exactly. So that, that mythical island of trash, it's, it's worse. The new metaphor that we've we've employed, based on you know the last five last six years of of twenty expeditions around the world through each of the five subtropical gyres, we're calling it a a smog of small particles. Everywhere I go, every time I drag a net above or below sea water of the surface, you find this smog of small particles all the way through, not just floating on the surface. All the way through, top to bottom. So in the Arctic, we were there just recently, and we were dragging our net. Um, and a, and a colleague from Vancouver Aquarium was doing subsurface analyses. They found clouds of small fibers from synthetic textiles. So this is the reality now. It's a smog of small microplastics that has gone global. And a lot of marine life are eating it. So these are only little particles. So is it only little fish that are eating this? Or is it impacting bigger animals as well? You think of all the, all the different groups that are in the oceans, from, from mollusks to crustaceans to, to oh, the bivalves, gastropods, crustaceans, the fishes, they're all eating it. And then the larger vertebrates, um, the marine mammals, the seabirds, the marine reptiles, they're all impacted by our trash, by ingestion or entanglement. And I can show you some other objects that we have found. And this is pretty right, common. So you look at the middle of the ocean. Well, that you might what's recognize. What's this one? This is a pot, obviously. Yes, yeah. a flower pot. You wonder how that got there, flowing down some river, washed off the beach. But, but no one's going to eat this, though, right? Well, they've tried. If you look here, you can see little U-shaped little bites. Oh, they're here too. These are turtle bites. Here? Yes. Here and here and here and here. Turtle bites and there are smaller little triangular bites out of the edges. Here's a bottle, a large detergent bottle. Mm -hmm. And along this edge and here, little triangular bites with little indentions above them. Those are trigger fish. So you can tell that these are trigger fish trying to eat this bottle. Yes. So a trigger fish has a very attractive overbite with two little teeth on top and they'll grab the plastic and their lower jaw is a triangular shape, they'll shear off a small triangular piece. So very quickly, these objects and others, the bags and the bottles and the single-use throwaway stuff, is becoming microplastic very fast by sunlight making the brittle, waves crushing it, or animals tearing it apart. Oh my gosh. Well, is it just the marine life that's not impacting anything that's on the land, though, it's strictly to the ocean? It's everywhere. 
And this is where it gets really interesting. You know, in the last, I'd say, like I said, 15 years, from a few hundred to over a thousand species, it's land and sea. And I brought you something um, sad, but, but interesting. I went back to, to Kuwait, first time in 25 years, about two years ago. And, but a whole different mission. I went there to look at plastics in the Gulf of Arabia. We went to Kuwait, to Dubai, Oman, uh, Oman and Qatar. And we're doing our research, bringing our trawls, skimming the, the, the surface of the Arabian Gulf. And I met a veterinarian in Dubai. Now, he was commissioned by Sheikh Mohammed to build the biggest camel hospital in the world. A camel hospital. $50 million to build a camel hospital. Amazing. And he's, he's an amazing human being. And he said, you know, I, I, I like the work you're doing, but let's go in the desert. I'm going to show you something. So we go 60 miles inland. Beautiful red sand dunes and acacia trees. And I see these piles of white. And they're the bleached bones of camels. We walk down to one. He pulls a rib out of the sand and says, here. He grabs one. Start digging. We start digging inside the rib cage of this buried camel, the skeleton only, get to the middle of the ribs, and we pull this out. This was from inside a camel. This is the smallest one that we got. What is it? It's, it's full of... It looks like uh, plastic bags. Yes, plastic bags and rope. I have some that are 60 pounds as big as a small garbage can. Perfect. I have five of these now he's sent me, and we're, and we're studying these right now. But he said 15 years ago he began to see plastic bags, plastic trash, and camels. And he said it impacts them three ways. It creates blockages. I can imagine. And oh, um, imagine this, 20 times bigger. Yeah, we're finding big ones. It creates a false sense of satiation. They feel they're full when they're not, and they become so they malnourished eating. and, and uh, dehydrated. And it creates a very septic, uh, bacteria-filled environment where bacteria grow in the folds of the bags and the trash in their guts. So now more and more, half the camels he finds are impacted by trash. So we have potentially a population-level impact by trash in, a, in that part of the world. So the camels are eating the plastic bags. It's these huge blockages are getting stuck inside them. <clears throat> they're getting sepsis from the bacteria. They stop eating and drinking because they feel like they're full. And then they're dying. Yes. So, I mean, clearly, uh, everyone, bags. everyone says, OK, that's got to stop. And everyone I meet, all the stakeholders involved, industry and policymakers, scientists, educators, artists, everyone says, OK, stop the flow of trash from, from land to sea and from cities out in the environment. All the conversation is there, but the debate is, is who's going to stop? Who's going to take the lead? And who's at fault? Well, how can we, is it something where we need to be lobbying government? Is it something where we need to be writing to, like, how do we stop this? What have you found to be, for the people at home that are watching this, what can we actually do? There is a, a, a growing movement. Um, there's Break Free from Plastic. There's Plastic Pollution Coalition. Plastic Pollution Policy Project, the world is organized. And the, the, the key word is zero waste. Reducing our consumption and, and loss of trash in the linear economy. It's a lot of words, but linear economy <laughs> means you, we make stuff, we consume it, and then it goes to either a dump or it gets burned in an incinerator. And the world's now thinking, the zero waste uh, uh, philosophy of thought is circular economies where you make something, it's in a biological cycle, it'll biodegrade, like banana peel or mm -hmm. paper. Or it's in a technical cycle where we get efficient ways to recover, reuse, to remanufacture, to maintain things to, uh, of the technical materials. Those two circular economies are going to allow us to prosper and not have mountains of trash in the near future. Well, you're from California. We're filming this here in New York City. And so I know, living in New York, I recycle and I have very little trash. It's mostly recycled. So that means I'm, I'm blame free. I don't have to worry because my trash is all being recycled, right? Well, if you recycle, if you reduce your consumption, if you buy things and you think of not just the product, also the packaging you're consuming, and think in circular economy terms to know where your stuff goes, that's where the future is. But industry doesn't want you to think that way. They, they want you not to support the bans on the single-use throwaway products, the biggest polluters. They want you to think that, uh, that recycling is good, but they, what they really advocate is waste to energy. They want to see plastics recovered and used to make power or to be incinerated. And that's counter to 
the, the zero waste philosophies that are sprouting around the world. And I understand industry has a vested interest because if recycling gets really good, then what's the need for new plastic? So I think industry is fighting us on that front. They are defending markets, whereas environmental NGOs worldwide are defending the future. So, so what, are, what are these corporations? They want you to buy the plastic and then they advocate for energy based on burning the plastic. So then we have to yes. buy more. So, so waste energy is the new term. And there are, there are different technologies. And open pit burning, which I see on islands around the world, and I grew up with that in Louisiana. I remember an incinerator. I remember our patent leather green couch being pushed into a big fiery inferno at the local dump. Patent that leather green couch. <laughs> very stylish back then in, yeah. the, in the 80s. But that's, that's changed now. Waste energy includes things like pyrolysis, making fuel, re bringing plastic back to um, a low-grade crude, mm -hmm. or gasification, which is, which is a high-temperature burn to create a synthetic gas and make power. So there are these waste energy technologies, but it's still a linear economy, and you're still making pollution, and they're very expensive. Zero waste, building in efficiencies and recovery and remanufacture, and repair and reuse are, are where the world, where much of the environmental NGO movement wants to go. All right, so let's get real though. I need to buy stuff. I need to buy my food and I live in a city. So how can I stop buying plastic? Well, I mean, if, if you look at the solutions available and there are solutions for everything, there's not one single thing I've found that has no, no circular economy solution for it. Um, if you think of where you want to go buy your, uh, your, your cheese and make your tortillas, the tough ones for me in California, because those are always wrapped in plastic. You've got to have your cheese. There are a few cheese shops, and, they, and there are, are bakeries that will make tortillas. Everything else, you can get your own bottle, reusable bottle. You can skip the straw. There's a company, Aardvark Straws, has been making paper straws since 1888. They're now, their business is, is booming because communities and schools and businesses are saying either skip the straw or go paper. Fit the biological cycle. Since the technical cycle, the recovery of straws, just it's extremely inefficient, doesn't work. Um, if you look at everything else, from clothing, there are many companies offering more natural fibers to avoid the synthetic fibers. Mm -hmm. Or for the synthetics, some synthetics, textiles, there are, there are improved recovery systems. So I think for every every material that we want to consume that's made from a synthetic polymer, there is a circular system to recover it or a benign alternative. It certainly makes it worth it if you're thinking, look, I need to go all the way to the cheese shop to buy my cheese so I can avoid plastic. But it helps me to think of you know, the camels and the, the little trigger fish eating my plastic as an alternative. So is it really worth the trip to the cheese shop? When you think of the sadness of, of uh, camels dying because they've got a stomach full of plastic, then it makes the cheese shop trip not, not too much of a sacrifice. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Marcus and Dr. Erickson, for joining us on the show today. We really appreciate your time and keep up the good work. You're welcome. Thank and you. Th thanks for joining us and see you next time.